don't have to run to the back. You can run to the front. Uh, it doesn't bother me if you run with money. Um, I appreciate your prayers before I start. Um, last Saturday, coming out of the blue, um, something hit my neck. And if you watch me, I'm very stiff-necked. It's not uncircumcised heart. It's just a stiff neck. And um, it hit my neck, and, and it got so painful you could hardly move. I can hardly move my neck. Um, and everybody w says, well, what's wrong? Well, of course, you know, somebody's, my neck's wrong. <laughs> and someone said, well, it's because you're out of alignment with God. Here we go. There's always a clever bot out there, isn't there? So anyone that thinks that, come here, and I'll get a word of knowledge on you and see... Uh, but very clearly, uh, something's not right, and uh, I haven't known pain like it for many, many years, but it's beginning to loosen a bit, but if you look at my neck, it's out of line, um, and so, so I'm waiting for it to all be healed, so uh, if I get excited, say to me, calm down, unless I get healed, all right? But I'm all for being healed, so, so that's really important. Um, I'm going to start this message um, in, in a strange way. Um, I want to ask you, has any of you here ever been despondent? Someone says, I've been watching someone say to their mom, what does that word mean? And she said, I don't know English well enough to tell you. Despondent means down, downhearted. And um, have you ever been like that? Now, if you're going to tell lies, you might as well not come to church. Because everybody goes through things. But sometimes we need to know what the Lord does when we're in those situations. So we're going to talk about it. But I'm going to start by saying this. When the Lord tells you to do something, you ought to do it. Uh, Mary actually said to the servants, she said, do whatever he tells you. She didn't even know what he was going to say. But, you know, his, his uh, word was, you know, fill the empty pots up with water. Because if you give me something to work with, I'll do anything. So there was a, a situation that I'm going to use as the message to start the message off. Uh, there's an old cowboy. Uh, he was in his 70s, very tall, never took his cowboy hat off. And he would come into the restaurant that sometimes I would go into on a, on a morning. And, uh, you know, he, he didn't have a lot of money because he walked. And, 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 and when he walked, he uh, walked all the way. So he kept quite fit. And one day, just recently, the Lord said to him, see him, give him some money so that he can get some breakfast. So I went up to the, to, the, to the people and I got some money for him in a car and gave it to him. And he was so excited and he kept putting his thumb up. Well, on Thursday, he was killed by a car. And um, the reason I'm telling you this is it starts the message is that when he tells you to do something, do it, because your last act to that man was an act of kindness. And the last thing he remembered was that someone ministered to him, and you never know what God might have you do. Um, so I was at a church last uh, week in, in Greenwich, Connecticut, um, you know, where all the poor live. Uh, quite some place, you know, you, you, you can't build a house in this area unless you've got four acres. And uh, it was quite a place and quite a church, actually. And the Lord gave me the word of the Lord for them. And I said, I'm just telling you something, you need to listen to the word of the Lord. And uh, they had a meeting last night, uh, a Friday night, and they sent me a picture. And they had taken the word of the Lord and placed it on a screen, you see. The reason I'm saying this is you don't make God waste his breath. You see? And so if, if, if the, word of the, Lord, if the word of the Lord can come to you from reading the Bible, how many of you know that? The Bible jumps out at you. In fact, if you want to know what God sounds like, spend more time reading the Bible. Uh, if you want to know what God t sounds like, spend more time praying. I don't mean demanding. There are moments you do that, but I just mean praying. You want to know what he sounds like? Get into worship, not worship of worship. If you worship worship, you'll never worship at all. Or if you worship the sound of a worship leader, you'll never worship at all. You need to worship. It means you don't even need to listen to someone else's great voice. You can let your frog voice out as long as it's worship. 
you know, what was that toad? No, it was me singing. But it, <laughs> it makes no difference. You're worshiping. Because you need the word of the Lord. I, I promise you there's an escalation. It's a big word, wasn't it? There's an escalation of the, the word of the Lord being released right now to people. And there's an escalation of it coming to you. And God might want you to be the vehicle, that's just like an American, vehicle, we used to say vehicle. He might want you to be the vehicle through which he said something to someone else that might be a life-changing moment. And you'll see in a moment why you might need a life-changing moment. So I was, I was in there yesterday. I went there. I tend to go more weekends than any other time. And I was greeted by the staff. And, of course, everybody's got masks on. I can never understand. When people have got masks on, I, I don't know if it affects my hearing or their speaking. Have you noticed when you've got a mask on, you can't read? You know, isn't it great that on the road to Damascus that Jesus met Paul? And I needed Jesus to meet me to get this mask off us. Amen. So they were saying, have you heard of blah, 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 blah. And I went, what? Blah, blah, blah. And eventually I said, what? They said, Ted. And then I went over to where Ted used to sit. And he would never take his hat off. And there was a little candle and it had Jesus on it. And there was a little reserve thing on the table. And, and, and you know, how he drank and everything was there. And they were giving him honor. And they were feeling a bit down. But this morning I went there and, and it was still there. And then one of his friends turned up who used to eat breakfast with him every Sunday morning. And there was such despondency sitting there. It was actually quite difficult to do anything. But how many of you know that despondency and downheartedness are realities of life? Sometimes, may I say, that before God moves next, you will go through that. Listen to this, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, how many of you know that you're walking somewhere difficult? You're not dead. You've got to get this in your thing. You shouldn't be at funerals. Dead people don't walk. They're carried. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now watch this. Your staff and your rod, they're with me to, to comfort me. Goodness and mercy follows me. So you're with me and you're following me. And sometimes you're letting me walk it so that you can be there to, to correct me and redirect me. And sometimes you go through a moment of downheartedness. All right? It's biblical. You say, why is it biblical? Because it's in the Bible. So wasn't that deep? Deep calls to deep in the roar of the waterfall. Some of us never had a waterfall, but let me just tell you something. I'll take you through some people. Elijah became so downcast and despondent that God had to send an angel to him. All right? Abraham became so downcast, and that's 1 Kings 19. Abraham becomes so downcast that God has to give him the word of the Lord to lift his eyes up. Get your eyes up from being downcast. Your eyes are down. All right? I'll give you the circumstances that draw it, all right? Peter gets so downcast and that in John 21, verse 3, he says, I'm going fishing. You know, and it's the funniest thing. The English have got a saying, and you all know what this is. They've got a saying that they say to people when they want them to clear off. So I'll do it with London accent. They go, go sling your hook, mate. It means go fishing. You see, that's the most famous thing. If you want someone to buzz off, they either go get on your bike, all right, or go sling your rope. It means buzz off. But what it, it does, it, 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 sometimes we go back to that which we came from when we're the most down, you see. And so Peter says, I'm just going fishing because I'm so down. An angel has to talk to the disciples in, in Luke 24, 5 and actually say these words to them. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Because they're so down, they're, they're really just coming to, 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 to like worship at a dead tomb because everything they've lived for is in that tomb. But the trouble is the tomb is now open. And so they're even more down about being down. 
So you've got to get this. It goes on, but sometimes it's the step to something greater in God if we know how to respond to what it is that happened. So the question is, what causes you or me or anyone to become despondent? Well, clearly in Ted's case, it's loss. Clearly in Abraham's case, it was loss. He had lost his nephew. He had cleared off and gone another way. And so he's got nothing left but his family and his servants. He's now lonely. And in his loneliness, his head is down. Now, this is the father of our faith. But his head is down. Circumstances have, have affected him. In Peter's case, it is failure. Now I saw you, all oh, your heads lift up a tiny bit. Because failure is something that, if you're human, you will fail. My wife used to have this great saying, if I used to say, but Christine, she'd say, hey, I'm not perfect. It worked for her, it never worked for me, I don't know why. But you're not. Face it. You are born again and you are being saved. And the land was taken step by step. And you're not there just because you're born again. You are born again. You're made right with God. But it doesn't make you to be absolutely perfect in every aspect of your life. The journey is taken step at a time. And God is, is healing you and redeeming you step at a time. But as he does it, you sometimes will trip up. And I'm going to shock you is that you are harder on yourself than God is on you. You've got to understand that he saved you knowing who you are. In other words, you are not surprising him. You didn't hear a sudden thunder from heaven. Oh, I cannot believe that he just did that. I am absolutely bewildered and bemused. Notice I didn't say amused. Strange the English language, isn't it? Why would you put the word bemused next to amused? The Lord's never shot by you. But you can be. The Lord is not in depression about your walk. He that began the good work in you, Philippians 1 verse 6, is continuing and continuing and continuing and continuing in that work in you. But the trouble is that sometimes when you do that thing that you don't think you should do, whatever that thing is that you, you thought that you had conquered, you then become down on yourself and you become despondent because of failure. That's why Peter wanted to go sling his hook. He wanted to go backwards to what he was because he felt he was such a failure. And, uh, uh, don't call me apostle. Don't even call me disciple. Call me fisherman. But watch out. Jesus turns up. He knows how to minister to you. And I, I want to prophesy to you, it will happen whoever you are. You know, isn't it interesting? We come to the throne of mercy to receive mercy. If you don't receive it, you don't get it. And if you won't forgive you, one of the hardest things in the world is to move on. If you don't receive mercy, you can't find grace. I can't find grace if I won't forgive what it was I just did. And sometimes we are so busy punishing ourselves that we stay in despondency. Where did all your joy go? Oh, it's just me. And every one of us battles it. I've battled it this week. Where, where, where something happens, and, and if you're in a lot of pain, it's amazing how you react to things sometimes. And then you're so despondent about the way you reacted that if you're not careful, you can put yourself time out. And time out is only time to look at the stop sign and say, why am I here? Not to stop driving. Amen? Well, I think I do not belong in the ministry anymore because I'm not good enough. You didn't call you. Can I just be rude to you? Can I just be rude? So you won't go around saying, 
Shut up. I've been watching too much of that Doc Martin. What do I mean by that? Because sometimes your own mouth just blabbers off. You don't even believe the thing you say. I'm just no good to anyone. Be careful with these moments because if you're not careful, you will sentence yourself to a prison sentence that God never had. It's a moment of despondency. It's a moment of failure. How about this, Proverbs 13, 12, where it says, Hope deferred causes the heart to grow sick. That means to be faint and sick within. And, and you, you thought something was going to happen. You thought something was going to happen. You thought something was going to happen, and it never did. How about long, non-answered prayer? I'm going to be honest with you. Is that all right? You need to see the state of my mother. I'll test you. And then you need to say, hello, what follows me? And I found out that I had become resentful at the Lord over my mother. Of course, none of you will know that. Look at all the perfect ones I've just read. You never give a shot. You know. Prince Charles has just been born over here. Now, it doesn't matter what it is. There'll be something. Someone steals money from you, and you can't believe that God will allow that. God will allow that to see how you react while it's happening. Do you believe that he'll restore because he's a restorer? Or if he doesn't do what you want when you, when you want it, you, you can get really despondent. And it will affect your faith because it's a trial of faith. See? And so you find yourself in despondency or downheartedness. See? Uh, trouble will do it. Uh, if you're in trouble at work, uh, no trouble like home trouble. No trouble like falling out with your wife or falling out with your husband or your kids not acting in the perfection that you used to act. <laughs> well, I had a comeback on that one. You were trying to stop them being you, but your blood is in them. And you, so I'm just giving you things that can cause such despondency. And, and the, the, using the, the Scottish and the wringing of hands. As you, as you say, my God, nothing like loss physically, nothing like for, loss relationship, nothing like loss of job, finance. All these things add up to bring those moments. Now, these moments will happen to all of us, but we need to understand what that then does to us. You find yourself, first of all, with, your, with a downheartedness. Your eyes are cast down. If your eyes are cast down, they're neither looking up nor are they looking forward. Your eyes are cast down because you're looking at your feet for some reason you didn't polish your shoes. No, your eyes are cast down because you can't pick your head up. You can't pick your head up because you don't want to pick your head up because you're downcast. Now, would you follow me all the way? You look, you look like you're depressed now. Follow me all the way because this happens to everybody, but it's what God does. You need to know things happen to you. Secondly, you can give up, my friend. How many times have you honestly, out of your own mouth, said, I give up? Only three people on this side of the church. All the people on this side just tell lies. It's happened to everybody Listen with your own mouth. You prophesied. I give up. Now, thankfully, God can be in that. But you see, what happened to Peter is he gave up. As far as he was concerned, he didn't even want to be with the rest of the disciples. He doesn't want to even remember his promises. He wants out. I give up. I resign my potential apostolic ministry. My foot in mouth can't get foot out of mouth. 
I'm going to give up even if I have to hobble up because my foot's in my mouth. I don't want to be around the people that hurt me when I made the promise. That's what upsets me with some of you guys. If you're sick, don't be such an idiot. Tell people so they can pray. Oh no, someone might, someone might treat me wrong. People treat you wrong even if you're right. I mean, I'm sure that someone will hear something in this message I never said. It doesn't, it, it's not the problem. The problem is it's your response to people reacting to you. But you have the plague. No, you don't. I've had the worst of the darn plague. And everybody in this church has acted so sensibly, but let people know, I can't pray for you if you don't tell me. My friend in England found himself in a, in a hospital bed and the English wouldn't operate on him because he was, quote, too young. And he's, about, he's heading for 40 and he's got gallstones in his gallbladder. They won't take the gallbladder out. They won't disperse the stones. And, and now he's got infection in, in, his, in, his, in his literal, in his colon. He's got infection all over his body because they wouldn't do it. But you know what he didn't do? He didn't hide himself. Well, people might judge me. I told him, come to America. You're in the wrong place. And he said, everybody help me. Pray for me. Help me. Don't be so proud. And that's what Peter's problem was. He was so proud, he didn't want to hang around with the people where he messed up. Never forget when I first got saved. I was so excited to talk about Jesus. He that's forgiven much, loves much, but sometimes he's a bit dumb in his love. And I didn't realize I, I wasn't, you've got to understand, I came off the street street, the street street. And, it, and if you think people swear here, you need to go to London. They use the F word for every other word in the English language. And so, so you just use, I just got to say, I'm trying to redeem my mouth. Right? I'm witnessing to a guy behind me who's been in the war and, and who doesn't want to receive Jesus because of the things he's done. And someone cuts me off. And before I could stop myself, the old man came up before the new man could grab him. You don't know the feeling of telling someone about Jesus and then dropping the wrong bomb because someone cut you up because you're not that redeemed yet. And then you've got to pick them up in the morning. <laughs> And my tongue is clinging to the roof of my mouth when I have to say, I'm so sorry. And I shrank down in my seat. And I was like Peppy the Pew. <laughs> driving the car saying, oh, get me out of here. But I couldn't get out of here because I'd done it. But the truth is, he didn't care less because he wasn't a snobby Christian. So you're feeling such a heel because what you think you did, when the truth is, the people you think you should run from don't give a flip. <laughs> but you must understand this is real stuff for you. And so you want to run. Now, the, the, the third one is, is terrible. Because when it happens to Elijah, he sits down in 1 Kings 19 and says these words. I am no better than my forefathers, which means I've judged who they were. And be careful what you judge because you become what you judge. And then he makes the statement, it is enough. I want to die. Be careful. Because at those moments, I felt it, you felt it. If you're real, there are times you've felt it. I'm just no use on this earth. And yet God hasn't sucked the breath out of your lungs. So he must think that's not true, but you think it's true. Well, I don't enjoy this anymore. <laughs> I've been there. Be very careful of that reaction, my friends, when you go into a place of despondency and downheartedness. He said, well, I didn't come to church to hear that I came for an uplifting message. If you haven't lived this, you haven't lived. 
But whoever preaches about it, only someone that's living it. Because if we want vision, because we're going to go there in a minute. Now we move to a worse thing. You move to, to, to what Elijah does next. The Lord won't, won't let him die. In fact, actually sends him an angel. And he is so despondent, he doesn't even care. Don't you hate that? A guy's got so much ministry from angels, he's so down, an angel literally brings him a whole cruise of water and, and b- bakes him the original angel cake. <laughs> Think about it. He wakes up. He doesn't even say, cheers, mate. Doesn't even go Australian. Cheers, mate. I'm just glad you, you know. He just grabs the cake, downs it, has the one, goes back to sleep. Don't we even... <laughs> doesn't even want to talk to the angel. I'm going to have a word with him in heaven. And then he wakes him up again and he's cooked him another one. And then tells him how to go on his journey. See, you've got a 40-day march. Hopefully by the time you get where you're going, you might have woken up from where you are. But he gets to where he's going and he hasn't woken up. How do you walk for 40 days depressed? Slowly. Should have been 20 days, shouldn't it? And the Lord speaks to him in 1 Kings 19, and and he literally says in verse 9, what are you doing here? Which is part of the answer to the problem. And, and And he comes out, he's practiced his spiel. He's practiced what he's going to say. Well, now you ask, Lord, I've been waiting. <laughs> William Shakespeare, take notes of what I'm about to do. Lord, they have done this and they've done that. They've killed the prophets. Now, hold you. You ready for this, Lord? Better do it with this one. Lord, I, only I am left. Now, what you don't know is he gave you the key to what happens and why you're despondent. Because you are caught up in I. I didn't say it didn't happen. I didn't say they didn't do it. I didn't say you didn't lose somebody. But your I just came up over his I. And the I am is now addressing you and saying, what's wrong with you? I. And you get caught up in I. And if you're not careful, if you don't get I out and him in, then you are going to literally give yourself up. So the Lord contests it as he does in in a moment. And you see, all these things start to happen. But the worst of them is you lose your vision. You don't wake up thinking, oh, I'm going to have another go. Give it another go, you know, as the Australians say. Someone came around my house yesterday and, and were telling me about a business. You know, we prophesied about some businesses starting. And they were telling me about the business and they were so excited. They didn't know this. But their volume went up. And they were talking like this. Suddenly they were, oh, 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 like, like, like that. That was quite good, actually. I thought you. And I thought, Wow. I think they've got caught up in a vision. Their volume went up. But when you lose your vision, your reason to get up. Come on, ladies, you know this. Men don't know it as badly. Empty nest syndrome. Where you are, she, oh, you can't wait? Are you prophesying? Your son's at the back. All right. <laughs> Did you hear that, Roger? She can't wait. All right. But you have no, he's just shaking his head like, oh, Jesus, she needs an encounter with you. Oh, God, I've known this for a long time. But the real truth is, when it happens to a lot of women, they lose their vision. Because that's where their vision was. I feel called to be a mother. And now, if that's where your vision was, these kids better soon get pregnant. Because now you need to be a grandmother. But if that's the only vision you have, mother, you've missed something in God. You catching that? I'm getting more reaction to this message. I don't know if it's negative. (laughs) 
It's all it's the women, the men are just going, oh sure, yeah, 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 yeah. I've heard more tongues come out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No wonder the Bible says that the Holy Spirit prays with his groans that cannot be uttered, because it's the, the men are going, oh yeah, yeah. I, have I touched any of you yet before I bring the antidote? Has that happened? Is that happening? Why am I asking? Because we're in a strange transition in the church of Jesus where everything we thought was going to happen, the opposite seems to have happened. And, and instead of we're jumping in through the next two, as, as all the doors were beginning to open literally for me everywhere, suddenly my dear wife gets sick, suddenly COVID turns up, suddenly you can't travel anywhere, suddenly everything you thought you were living for has now gone. But the Holy Spirit's been talking to me. Listen to me before I bring you the antidote. He's been talking to me. He said, I'm watching what's going on in the middle of this. And you see, a lot of people are hypocritical to the core of their being. They shout everything. I'm not going to church. It's too dangerous. Well, they, they go into to clubs and pubs and restaurants. And you hypocrites. Because the dangerous places where the people of God are, no, the dangerous places in your heart. And you're shouting to me, don't talk like this, I'm talking. Because God is watching us how we go through this transition. We cannot do what we're doing. We cannot be hypocrites. Church is dangerous, but work isn't. Oh no, they wear masks. They also sneeze. I'm not saying to be careful is wrong. I'm saying don't be a hypocrite. And the Lord's been talking to me about I'm watching everything that's going on because you see the people that I want to bring out of this shaking are the ones that I have desired that will become people that stand in the midst. You see, it tells us in the midst of trouble, don't leave your post. Don't give up. Heard of a minister the other day. The only reason I heard of him, I ministered in his church years ago, and he wrote me to, to argue with me. But the trouble is he, he didn't hear what I said. He's quoting scriptures at me everywhere. And I said, well, that can't be true because God brought you from South Africa and repositioned you, but something's wrong with the way you're reacting. And then I get hold of another minister who says, yeah, he's never reopened his church. He won't reopen his church. Sorry. I'm not going that way. I want to give you some hope. And to see me on screen isn't good enough. Now, that was a Joel Osteen moment. You should have taken it. I've been practicing it. I'm actually going to get him to lay hands on me to see how I can smile like that. I don't go too far because some of you are going to get mad at me. But you need to make sure that during this moment, you don't let your despondency rule you. And don't prophesy yourself into the death place. And don't make God a liar because we're going through something. Check church history out. Every time there were major epidemics, and every time, check out, check out what move of God came in the 1920s after the Spanish flu. Begin to check things out. And God, in the middle of things, prepares people for what he wants. But we need to learn how to deal with our moment. We need to learn how to, when this sickness hits, it makes you very despondent. And you can even do, how could you let it? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that means I can walk through things I don't want to walk into. i got one person with me. Some people watching are saying, I'm never going to watch you again. Well, you need to. Because prophetically, we're in a very big moment. All right? And, and it's time to look up and not give up. So this is what I'm going to actually say. What does the Lord do when he steps in? Now, watch in everything I've quoted to you. For instance, in Abraham, he steps in and speaks. In Peter, Jesus himself turns up. With the disciples, the angels turn up. All right? Elijah gets double shot. He gets double whammy, angel and the voice of the Lord. And that doesn't work, so he gives him an earthquake and a fire. 
He had a strong wind. Yesterday when I walked out of my house, I thought we were ready for the next two. What a wind. I opened my, my door and had to hold it like this with, with, my, with my foot as I got in because it, it would have tried to shut off and, and, and cut my leg off the, the speed of the wind. Give me the fire. So watch this. I'm going to give you some of the things the Lord does. When he turns out to Abraham, who's the father of our faithful, he literally tells him, listen, look up. Don't stay down. Look up. Why? Because what you don't know is that what you're walking through is going to give you the ability to see what you would never have seen if you hadn't walked through what you just walked through. I want you to look up. I'm prophesying into the air. Look up, look up, look up, look up. Look again, look up. Why? Because when the look up, it means I'm no longer looking at my despondency, my failure, the things that are done. But I'm looking up, looking for, well, I look to the hills for where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will neither slumber nor sleep. Look up. The closing of one door has been said for years, means the opening of another or the opening of more. But if you don't look up, you don't see the door. Well, I lost my job. It's all over. No, I've lost my job. Lord, what, what are you up to? I think I'm going to look up. Hallelujah. And the next thing the Lord says is eat up. He says, to, he says to Elijah, look, eat that cake, you, you've got a journey. Eat that cake, you've got a journey. What on earth was in that cake? Keto. I would laugh, but it's not funny. All right, no. Because there was no gluten intolerance in those days because they didn't make things the same way. But whatever it is, it was whatever he liked. In your case, it would be what a burger cake. It would see God knows how to feed you what you need to eat, but you see, you need to eat up. You see, in other words, instead of slamming the Bible closed because you messed up or things didn't work, open the Bible up and say, Lord, what word do you have me to, to have today? There's a psalm, I believe it's Psalm 73, verse 22. It speaks of, uh, it speaks of one of the David's sons. And he was the worship leader, Asaph. And, 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 and so when David touched God, so did his sons, the sons of Korah and Asaph. They touched the Lord the same way. And Asaph's going through this thing, and he's wrestling with what's happening. And he suddenly says these words. He said, I became like a brute beast. I was so angry until I went into the sanctuary and the Lord could talk to me again. Eat up. Don't shut up. Eat up. Go back to the Word. Go back to promises. Fill yourself with truth in the moment where you don't want to eat at all. It's very important. Because you're never ready for anything if you don't eat. So look up and eat up. But sometimes God has to confront you. Have you ever been confronted by the Lord? You see, if I'm not going to change, God has to change me. Listen to this. Angels don't move Elijah. The voice of God doesn't move Elijah until the Lord confronts him and says to him, what are you doing here? No, no, no. I don't want to hear about Jezebel. I want to know what you're doing here. You're here. You say, well, the angel told him to. The angel only told him to because he gave up. So God sent him on a journey for 40 days to meet God because he didn't have to go that way. And if you don't listen, you might get sent on a journey that you wish you never got sent on. And it's always alone. So he confronts him. He says, what are you doing here? You never had the Lord do that to you? I'll never forget before that great move of God that you will remember that started in December 1993 and Sammy Heen is preaching on three times holy 
and I'm sitting in the second row and, and the voice of God speaks to me and shocks me. I've just come through the most tumultuous thing in, in, in my life, all right? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still down. Three and a half years of, of persecution. And I'm still down and the Lord suddenly says to me, you... And shows me a vision of myself. And shows me a vision of myself giving up. And says, you. And by the time he finished confronting me, I'm sitting there weeping and weeping and weeping. Not believing that I could have done that in my, in my, my moments of despondency. But what you don't know is when he confronted me, that night began a move of God that lasted a year in this church. When you think that you're at your worst, God might be about to bring you to your best. And you need to say to God, if I'm ever wrong, confront me. Now, you've got to understand, he won't always confront you from his word alone. He might, might not always confront you personally. He might confront you through a prophet. He might confront you through your wife. He might have one of your children say something to you that will shock you. Because they didn't even know they could be used by God. And they thought they just had an opinion. And suddenly he confronts you. What are you doing here? You, you don't understand that Jezebel and Shekel. And you don't understand. And I, I'm the only one that made it. And the Lord said to him, Dumbo. I've got 7,000 others. And they're not behaving like you. You catch that? Because God is after something. And I pray this word's like that for us. And then he makes another statement to him. You need to go back the way you came. You spent 40 days out of your ministry. Now it's going to be 80. That never needed to be had. Now go back the way you came. Not only go back to where I met you under the juniper tree, but go back to where you slaughtered those people that were against me. Go back to where Jezebel threatened you and you gave up. <laughs> Come on, you're not liking this, are you? I, I, didn't, I shouldn't have ever preached this, really. Because I, I just want you to like me, you see. As long as you like me, and I'll come back. Bottom line, I want you to meet God. I want me to meet God. If I've been through something, it's for you. All right? So, so bottom line, do we want what the Lord has? There are times to go back to the point that we made that silly decision. Go back to the point where you told God you're not doing it anymore. Go back to the, the moment you said, well, you don't answer prayer, so I'm not praying. You, you, nobody ever does that. Go back to where you wanted to go to the easy church. Because in the easy church, you're never going to get confronted. They're going to make you feel so good about yourself, but you never do feel good about yourself because you don't feel good about yourself. Anybody here ever been for a massage and never felt any better? I'm supposed to feel really good. Well, I didn't feel really good because they didn't touch the spot that was really the problem. It was right in here. I think I'll come back and do the next part next week. I'm a little tired. <laughs> now listen to this one. The angel of the Lord saying to the disciples, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why do you keep talking about what's dead? Why do you keep going on about what happened to you? Because it's not dead. But the Lord said, it is dead. You won't let it die. And so you live in your dead deadness because you won't let living kill off the dead. That takes a Sila moment. Selah means think about it. See, you can rehearse it, but if you never stop rehearsing it, one of the meanest people I ever met, and I've met some mean people, 
And I want to say this to you. Not everybody who says they're a Christian is. They are believers, but their fruit has no Christianity in it at all. One of the meanest people I ever met, and Chris has met the same person, was a person that said they were a Christian, but rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed what went on when they were young. So it was never put to death. Come on, have you ever had an argument and one of you says to the other one, well, I can remember. I'm like an elephant. I remember exactly what you said back there. Well, then you're not like God because he can't. Have you, allowed, have you allowed your death to rule you? Or will you let resurrection life come in? Isn't it interesting that the angel rolled the stone away and we might have some sto stones to be removed? Have you ever heard anybody make this statement? I'll never, ever trust another. What did you just do? You just said my death experience rules my life experience. So, for instance, let's just throw two out there, okay? I'll never trust another man. So all men are non-trustable. Every single man that lives on the face of the earth is non-trustable, including the man, Christ Jesus. I'll never trust another woman. That means every single woman is exactly the same. So Mary was not pure. Well, let me tell you. I'll never trust another pastor. That's why I won't call myself pastor. I don't know why you spend so much time throwing a title out that the Bible doesn't hardly talk about. I'll never trust an another preacher. Never hear from God then, will you? Yeah, but, but a, a preacher let me down. A preacher might. There might be two. There might be three. But are all of them the same? When I grew up, you're going to hate this. Prepare. Seatbelts, turbulence. When I grew up, there were multiple people in England hated you lot. Because you'd come in in the war with all the money and taken all the women. And all I grew up hearing, oh yeah, those loudmouth Americans. And I've got a friend, he's now living in Canada. He said, I'll never trust an American. I said, what are you doing now? What have you done? You've made a judgment on something that happened, but you don't. And when you arrive here, you've got more quiet Americans than you can believe. But the judgment brings death to overall life. Oh, I'll never, I'll never trust anybody. I'll never confide in anybody. Then the Bible says you're in trouble. Because it says confess your faults to one another. Yeah, but they might gossip. If you're dead, you don't care if they gossip. They're going to gossip whatever you tell them. So give them something to gossip about. But godly people like our church can't even, I don't care. You couldn't tell me one sin I've not run into with someone before. And I've run into them. We've seen grave robbers. We've seen people having sex with animals. We've done it all. And they turned into some of the greatest people you've ever met. Unless you want to stay in your death. Yeah, but I failed. I don't think I can ever do it again. Well, I'm going to give you this incredible revelation. You're going to fail again. And you might fail again. But if you put your eyes back to He, you'll find out that the, it's not about your failure. It's about His success in what He's already done. You know, if you know anything about sickness that... Sometimes there's these massive sicknesses and they find answers to them. And then below that sickness was another one that nobody knew about. And you know, you go out, have you, any, any of you had a big sin? Come on, come on, tell the truth, tell the truth. It's, I can't get hands up in this church. 
Let's try it again. Any of you had one that, at least for you, was like, well, <laughs> all right? You know, I, you know, I graduated with a 4.0. It was me. And you got rid of it, and you thought, oh, my God, you are wonderful. And then suddenly this little voice goes, oh, I could come out now. <laughs> the ring, the ring. You know, it, <laughs> where, where were you? I was hidden by, by the big one. But don't worry, when I get fully grown, it will make that look like nothing. I ought to watch this message quite good. <laughs> Folks, you, 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 can't, you can't do that. You have to say, Lord, if you killed that one, you'll kill that one. If you got that one, you'll get that one. If I worship that, then I will stay in death. But if I give you chance, I'll move into life. Now listen to what else he said. It's just two more. It, listen to what else he said. He said, now listen, Elijah. I want you to go back the way you came, and I want you to anoint. You want me to do what? I want you to go and release your anointing. My anointing? I gave my anointing up under the juniper tree. Any of you ever played uh, basketball? Well, Terry, you better have played basketball. Any of you ever played uh, any, any, any professional sport? If you haven't, I, uh, sorry. <sighs> Why are you guys so clever? I, I, can't, I can't keep up with you. A thing that is played professionally. So hockey, you ever played hockey? You ever played soccer? You ever played football? You ever played... All right. What, all right. What, it's coming out. It's coming out. Truth is coming in the midst of the house of God. And then you get either not allowed to play or you get a timeout. And you're put on the sideline, and as you're on the sideline, you're watching the game, but you're not in the game. It doesn't make you think you can't play the game. You just need to get back in the game to play it. Does that make sense to you? And so sometimes I think we get taken out of the game. We think, that's it, I'm done. I, I, I can't do it. I just haven't done it for a while. And the Lord said, no, no, the only way you're going to get back is if you go back and start using your ministry again. If you go back and start talking and praying for people again, if you start caring again, you'll find out nothing ever went. You just put it down. And that's why the Lord had said to me a few weeks ago, if you start, I'll start. Yeah, but I don't feel it. Well, you never feel it till you do it. So in other words, folks, when you're down, the best thing to do is get up and minister to someone. Even someone less down than you. But I don't feel like it. I'm sure Elijah went, feel, I don't feel like it. No wonder he had 40 days. <laughs> he had 40 days. Oh, please, oh, God, let it come back. Oh, let it come back. Oh, God, please, Lord, 40 days. <laughs> How am I going to do it all? Oh, well, I know what I'll do. I'll find the easy one. He told me to anoint two kings. And then Elisha, the son of Shaphat, I think I'll head for the easy one. So he leaves the kings alone. And he finds Elisha, the son of Shaphat. And you don't know how long he stood at the edge of the field. You don't know if he didn't stand at the edge of the field and say, oh, do you think he's going to receive it? Oh, I don't know. Oh, God. Is there still anointing in his? I don't feel any anointing. I feel so down. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. And then suddenly in a burst of energy. He grabs his mantle, and, and he doesn't even stop. He takes his mantle, and he just comes by. <laughs> and he and looks back. Did anything happen? And Elisha's going, bleh, 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 bleh. what was that? Bleh, 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 bleh. You've, never, you've never seen the whole story. You've only got the bit that's written. And it says, Elisha runs back. He grabs it and goes, oh my God, what was that? And he runs after Elijah. He said, I don't know what that was. But hang on. I'm getting rid of my past and where I've lived because I want some of that. 
And you got you got to be in Elijah's shoes. He's probably thinking, I was anointed when I was down. You think every preacher gets up or, or Sasha gets up and is on the morning, oh, I feel like it this morning. She's driving up in the car going, mm, I got it. Mm. Oh, can you hear me? Mm. She doesn't come in like that. She comes in all dry. And then some preachers, you don't know what they go through. Oh, God, I, have I got to do it? I just don't feel it. I don't know if I should do it. Oh, God, where's the anointing? I don't feel anything. Until they get up and do it. This is called the Dennis experience this morning. It was called the Dennis Entertainment Theatre. Now, this is very deep as I bring this to a head. In those moments of obedience are the moments where God releases everything you've been through to take you to a higher level. You thought it was the death of you. God thought it was the beginning of the new life of you. See, if God's strength is magnified by your weakness and you just went through one of the worst sicknesses of your life and you say there's nothing, God's strength, when you put your hand out, there's nothing of you left. But through your weakness, the Lord begins to minister. When you crashed and you, your face print is in the wall because you hit so hard and you go, oh my God, I'm, there's nothing left. The Lord says, oh yes, there is. Go minister. I'll release you into a new arena. I'll take you to raise the greatest son that you could have had in the Old Testament. So great will your anointing be on that boy that he'll run in double what you got. At the moment you thought it was all over. I just come back to, I told you there was two, there's one more. Come back to, to Abraham. I don't really want you to lift your head, you downcast man. I don't want you to just look. I want you to walk through the length and breadth of the land. Because I'm not just telling you about that I'm going to let you see some things. I'm going to let you walk where you've never walked. So Abraham, the man of faith, got some wisdom. And moved his tents from where his loss was. grabbed his tents and moved them to the great trees of Mamre where the beginning of his new day would be. He moved tents. He wasn't going to live at the lost site. He was going to live at the, the seeing site. Now, if any of you got any time, because I know you're so busy, if you read from Genesis 13 all the way through Genesis 20, 21, it's amazing what you will read. From the moment Abraham, in his pain, obeyed God, he had revelation after revelation after revelation, experience after experience, and his whole body was turned upside down because he changed where he sat. So what's my message? I don't care how despondent, I don't care what you go into, I don't care what failure you just went through. Don't listen to people. Your spirit inside you is arguing with you. And it's telling you this could be the beginning of the greatest day. Because God hates pride. He hates all these guys that get up and I've never seen her. Never seen it. There's Credence Clear Order Revival had a song years ago. I've never been a sinner. I've never sinned. What a bunch of lies. That was a lie itself. And if you get any preacher or anybody looking down at you, because, oh, you went there, did you? Folks, some of the greatest men I've ever met were some of the weakest men I ever met. They had weaknesses that, that were so glaring. But when they got up to minister, there was no pride left. And God could move. Why? Because God will allow you to face you. 
you don't face you, there's nobody can help you. You're too arrogant to have anything. But if you do face you, you're not as bad as you think you are. Hallelujah. The Valley of Accor was a place of trouble. One person, Achan, troubled Israel. Yet it says in Hosea 2 and verse 15, I have turned the valley of Accor, trouble, into a doorway of hope. Do you get it? Are you hearing me? If we live on our glaring failure, if we live on our loss, if we live on that which is dead, we'll stay there. But if we say, Lord, humble though it might be, humbled though I might be, I'm going to walk again. I'm not going to walk in my strength. Though they, they go through the valley, they shall turn it into. And rains will come and pools will appear. Where in the place of the weakness is the place of the greatest strength. You honestly don't hear messages like this. And you say, well, what's that got to do with a vision? Everything. Because when we hear a vision, sometimes we already say, oh, I can't do that. You, you don't know what I'm walking through. But he does. Okay? So sometimes in faith, you've just got to say, in faith, I take that. In faith, I take that from my past. In faith, I take that for the future. And say, Holy Spirit, remind me. Please remind me of what you said. My greatest strength was my greatest weakness. I would never give in in any game, in any fight, till the Lord stepped into the ring. And when he knocks you down, you're knocked down. Now, his greatest strength works with my greatest weakness. He never gives in. Lift your hands. Hey, can we sing that angel song? Particularly that thing about lift your hands. At this moment, this is when we invite God in and say, Lord, this church, these people, those watching, lift our hands and praise the Lord. It's not about us, it's about you. Then I've just got one or two people to minister to, and you can all go home. Times are wanting, when times, times are need, and lift your hands and praise the Lord, lift your hands and praise the Lord, lift your Inviting you in, Lord. You're here. Lift your hands and praise the Lord. Lift your hands and praise the Lord. Oh, lift your hands and
In my times of weakness, in my times of storm, I lift my hand and praise the Lord. In my times, in my times of sorrow, in my times of despair, I'll lift my hands. to do is very important. Aaron, I want you to do something for me. There's a lady kneeling down over there. And when I came into the auditorium, the Lord started to talk to me. And he does that. He suddenly pinpoints a person out. He started to talk to me about what she's been going through. And it and it, it literally said to me, she's been going through a terrible season of loss after loss after loss after loss after loss. And the Lord said to me, I, you need to tell her from me, not only have I been watching the loss, but I declare to you that I won't leave you in loss. That I, I'm, I'm going to turn your life around. Now, the important thing is before I have Aaron, the reason I want Aaron, because I believe he has a faith to speak life and prosperity to you, all right? But you, you have to hear me before, before this comes. It's not, not what God intends, it's whether you will let him. And I want to break off you in the name of Jesus. Mike, Mike, come over here quickly. I want the whole congregation, you say, well, this is personal, but you've got to hear this. There's a, there's a sorrow is unto death sitting on you right now. And all I want you to do, not, not even loud, Mike, is put, put your hand on and start praying sorrow. And Carol, you have to let death go. I don't want to talk about your brother. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the death of everything you ever put your trust in. All right? And I want you to let the sorrows unto death go. Now, the moment, Mike, you, you just pray that offer, she has to let it go because you won't get life in death. There's a future generation, Carol, yet to, uh, to affect. And I, I believe to prophesy that God might totally yet change what you do as a vocation. Now, just so we won't take too much time, he, he's praying. So all I want you to do, Aaron, is put your hand on her back. And I want you to, out of the faith that you have, Speak a season of turning around on a prosperity into her life. Now she needed to hear this, my friends. The Lord talking to me means that she was in a place of total despair. And the Lord had to let her know how he was thinking about it all. And that's what this is all about. We now yield up the things in our lives. We yield up even our responses. We yield them up and say, Lord, it might not have been the way I thought it would be. I might have not have acted the way I thought I should. But Lord, I receive from you the word of life. I will not be determined by my mistakes. I will not be determined by the things that have happened against me. But I will be determined by your purpose for me. And just for a moment, as, as they're praying, you reach into God. I believe this is a turnaround point for many here and many watching. And many could say, well, I wanted a prophetic word. You don't understand. The prophetic speaks into the now. And when the Lord said to Elijah, what are you doing? It was the prophetic. He's speaking into his now. Come on, turn around. I've got someone for you to anoint. I've got a future for you to walk in. 
And there's great grace. I want us to receive that on behalf of those here and those who couldn't be here. Receive that in the name of Jesus. I know why I had that dream last night. As you think something's closing out, God shows you, no, look what I'm about to do. Now, this has got nothing to do with our congregation, but this has got everything to do with your, your cousin. The Bible says the leech has two daughters. Give, give, they say. And as I was praying about your cousin, I saw a lot of things for his future, and I believe that the, the leech has got its talents into your cousin. And he has been sucked and cheated by many. And even within the church. And the Lord says, I want to give this man a new beginning and to put his footprint in a new place so he can shake off what's been going on in his life. And there are those praying against that happening because they're like leeches and he doesn't know how to say no. Don't know the man, but I'm just telling you. And you need to release that to him. And I break the power of the leech that has got into your cousin and or his cousin or nephew or one of you. I just break it in the name of Jesus. Amen. You want to know the power when God speaks into a situation. And if this morning the Lord spoke into your situation, you, you don't want to walk out of it and say, oh, that was a nice message. No, it wasn't a nice message. It was a real one. And some of you youngsters, the, the enemy wants to come and destroy your lives. I'm telling you, youngsters. And he wants, he wants to, to, to get you off. And he wants to get you with the people that want to do this and get rid of you. And I, I come against that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I want to prophesy a future into you. I, I call the Spirit of God that has touched you to rise up. Oh, young, young people in God, rise up. I've got a verse to leave with you, if I may. The Lord gave it me this week when I was praying about this situation, and He won't leave me alone, so I'm going to give it to you. It's Psalm 37 and verse 4. It says this, For those who delight themselves in the Lord, He will grant the desires of your heart. Now listen to the prophecy. The Lord said to me on the way in this morning, proclaim a season of the desires of the heart literally being opened. The Lord says like double doors being thrown open into the new. The Lord says this season shall throw open the doors to the desires of the heart being fulfilled. And you would question and you would say, Lord, but, but what desires? The desires that I have placed in you and now have become your desires and you and I are agreeing on your desires and I will throw open the doors that have held you. I believe that a judgment has been released from the courts of heaven. I believe that the righteous judge has written a decree that everything that has gone against his purpose and his desires be broken in your lives if you will agree with it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, be it unto us. According to your word. Amen. Now the homework. Right? Treasure it. Ponder it. Pray it. Don't let it go. Don't neglect it. Church, we bless you. Through this week and we say the Lord's face be upon you. His name be upon you. His presence be upon you. We say peace to you in Jesus' name. God bless you all.